Hello, lovely podcast people. It feels like a long time since I've spoken to you, but for you, I imagine it feels like one week because I recorded a few before I went away on holiday. It was lovely, thank you, went to Mexico. And um, this podcast is sponsored by EOS or EOS Promotions Limited. I feel so bad, Rebecca Wilkinson, Managing Director. Rebecca came to my tour in 2019, right? Oh, also, you can now watch videos on Spotify. There's like Spotify video. If you're a Spotify listener, you're on your walk, get your phone out of your pocket or out of your little armband or wherever you keep it. Click something that says video. This is also a video now, as well as videos on YouTube. But anyway, thank you so much for all of your reviews. Again, if you're listening on Spotify, just click Not Another Nutrition Podcast that you're listening to me on right now and just rate it. And we've already gone over how you should rate it. But anyway, so those of you who are watching, this shirt that I'm wearing, Rebecca sent me this in when I did my tour. That's what it says, Martin McDonald here. But I found it in the letter, the the bag that she sent it in unopened. I feel so bad. Anyway, that's why this podcast is sponsored by you, Rebecca, and your company. And I did actually check that the company was still going and will order some stuff from you. Anyway, <clears throat> thanks. This shirt fits great. My arms have grown since 2019, so nice and tight, slim fit. It's brilliant. Anyway, this podcast episode, while I was away in Mexico on holiday, someone asked the question, what would you do if you had one hour exercise, one hour time per day, would you do an hour of walking or an hour of resistance training for fat loss? So the goal is there, fat loss. Fat loss in and of itself is not the complete story for everyone. And so I obviously, have to run with this. This is why podcast format is great. We can talk around the subject a little bit. There's no right or wrong answer because the thing with these questions is lots of people DM me like long-winded answers. Uh, to be honest, I put up a question box, which would you pick? Or a, a poll. People send me these long DMs. I'll be honest, I don't read them because I don't care. I've asked you a question with a poll. I gave you the format. I wanted it in. If I wanted an open discussion, I'd say DM me. I did not. If you don't attach nudes, of course, I'm not going to spend as much time time in that mess. I'm joking, kind of, sort of, am I? So, you know, lots of people are like, well, you know, I would do this, I would do that, it depends, blah, 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 blah. That's the whole point of me doing this podcast, not for you to say in my DMs, just which would you pick? It was just an interesting thing, just click the button, move on, it's fine. It's not a test. So there's no particular right or wrong answer, but I've given it a little ponder and I'm just going to talk to you a bit, as ever, about what the research says, maybe in and around this subject. So it does depend on the really specific outcome you're looking at. It does depend on the situation. So if we take this to the extreme, you have one hour to move in a day. All your other time, you don't have time to get off the bus one stop early and do the extra walking there. There are no stairs at your place of work. You have to use the lift or you already use the stairs, but it doesn't contribute to your steps. And, you know, are you doing 10,000 or 5,000 or like, like me, 800 steps a day. Your starting point does again dictate maybe where the answers go. Are you forcing me to pick between one or the other or can I go 30 minutes of one and 30 minutes of the other, for instance? Now, interestingly, there is quite a lot of research on walking as well as lots of research on resistance training. Some of these have done some comparisons between the two. As you can imagine, interestingly, where I've read or, you know, I've read slash where there is a good amount of research is actually more in the realm of weight loss maintenance than weight loss. And while it would be easy for me to just go, yeah, we can just extrapolate those results, you can't necessarily. What I will say is, is that during the phase of weight loss maintenance or attempted, should I say, weight loss maintenance, which, you know, can be done. For, for instance, there's a, this just cropped into my head. It's not the study I was about to talk about, but a different study that looked at weight loss maintenance and they essentially assigned them. I talked about this study in my, you know, compassionate approaches to rapid fat loss lecture at Mac Nutrition Live last year, this year, last year. What month are we in? Last year, I guess. Or did I even? I might have removed it before I actually did the talk because I didn't, I never have enough time for all my slides. But essentially comparing a thousand versus 2000 calories burnt during walking 
over a week? And was there any difference between the two in terms of how it affected weight loss maintenance? And interestingly, in line with other work in this area, there didn't seem to be a difference between the two. So you essentially got this hugely diminishing returns above roughly a thousand calories per week walking. And um, I think it was, was it a brisk walking? I'm not actually sure it was. That's potentially a different study that I'm thinking of. And so, you know, in this instance, we get this idea of, well, this is quite in line with some of the recommendations that we get this sort of 30 minutes of walking per day, ideally brisk walking, for instance. So above a thousand calories per day, hugely diminishing returns with regards to weight loss maintenance. And in that study, I believe the follow-up was around two years and a significant proportion of the subjects were within plus or minus about a kilogram of their end weight from the weight loss period they had done before that. So we've got that interesting instance. And other stuff with regards to weight loss maintenance, a different study. And obviously all of these studies that I will mention, I will then speak to my staff who time point this and they will get the studies off me and they will be linked in the show notes on my website martin-mcdonald.com forward slash ep and whatever episode this is like 80 something at the minute i guess and so another study weight loss maintenance during the weight loss you know attempt i always say this attempted weight loss maintenance period because some people gain some people continue to lose and some people say the same give or take and one interesting difference this was walking versus resistance training in this weight loss maintenance period is that what happened was that as you can imagine resistance training is very good when you're in a surplus some of those calories will be used towards lean body mass gains so when i said at the beginning of the podcast it depends on the overarching goal is it just pure weight loss or is there some kind of body ideal that you have in your head and does that body ideal look like someone who resistance trains and has some muscle and has the shape of those muscles because for some people you know muscly isn't beautiful you know even femininity with muscle isn't their goal i'm trying to be quite specific specific with my words here because you know there's this whole oh you won't get really muscular it's like you but you will gain some muscle and you will look different you will be you will have curves in a different way that are muscular it's like yeah well that's beautiful is it is it what that person wants everyone's different in their ideologies of what they want and what they believe is beautiful and what they want for themselves it's not for us to say but there's quite um old studies So I'm not just speaking out of turn. I'm not just kind of being very PC here sitting on the fence. But there are differences in what people want. But then we can look at some of the literature, you know, decade old literature, you know, two decade, three, I don't know two to three decade old literature looking at body image. So that's just basically based on what people view themselves at. So with all their different ideologies and those who partake in weight loss programs using resistance training versus walking, those who participate in resistance training ended up with better, you know, significantly better body image. Now, that's a can of worms because it's like, oh, you know, people could go, you know, well, that's because of the body ideals that society is pushing on them. And therefore, and yeah, cool, fine, have that discussion. But I don't think anything much has changed in that time other than maybe more larger body fat acceptance that you know the movement is there it's a huge movement it is doing something it is already having positive and negative impacts on people and you know yeah i won't go any further with that but we probably still are in the same place where doing resistance training would improve people's body image of themselves and actually body image being this hugely interconnected network of just there is a level of just body appreciation. If you, if your body can do stuff and it's functional, it may look exactly the same, but you still have better body image because it just does stuff and you're like, wow, it's powerful, it's strong, it's whatever. So anyway, this discussion, you know, I, I have this discussion. Really, this is just one of these people get drunk late at night and they sit up and they just hash out, they just talk about the world. And that, that's what my podcast is. But I'm just bringing some of the research in this area to you. Now, It is just that thing of if people who do a lot, there are differences in how people react to things. So I think this is the one that came up in my mind earlier, brisk walking interventions. So, right, we're going to make all of these people do brisk walking and lots of it and monitor weight changes and health market changes. And the reason this study just popped into my head because I was about to talk about NEAT. And in this study, they looked at people's changes in activity levels, you know, non-exercise activity, NEAT, 
or NIPA, non-exercise physical activity. And some people actually, and we've known this for a long time, it's potentially even exacerbated when they do like high intensity exercise, like cardio, you know, loads and loads of exercise. But even in this brisk walking program, some people became less active at other times of day because of this. And so you have this genetic, I've ta- I talked about genetics in my p- very recent podcast quite in depth and I probably touched on some similar stuff to this and actually I'm going to talk more about this with regards to all these idiots now in the industry talking about personalized nutrition and and I I called this stuff out first you go and try anyone who called out people like Tim Spector before me I called this out long 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 ago I knew he was going to be the next Tim Noakes even maybe it was on my podcast so you know how long has my podcast been going anyway so I'm going to do some stuff on this on inter-individual variations. You know, lots of you all know I've been talking about DNA testing and food intolerance testing, all these things that supposedly give us these personalized, this ability to personalize what we do with our nutrition or exercise that just do not work. Microbiome testing, all of this stuff. But in this study, for instance, this brisk walking, it was like, yes, some people got less active when they started doing a planned brisk walking exercise intervention program so there is an element there would you know about that probably not in the re- people go oh you got to test what works for yourself and it's like eh. you probably wouldn't know if your neat went down as a result of walking and walking you know across the board people getting these health benefits so you know no one walks more becomes more active and suddenly it's like oh my goodness they're cardiovascular disease risk factors are going up like that doesn't happen some people get brilliant effects some people get you know very little effects especially if there are other activities going down but the brisk walking will you know the cardiovascular system will benefit from that so again getting away from this purist view of like calories burnt is good one other thing that sprung to mind with regards to this idea is the fact that resistance training during a targeted fat loss intervention, so we're, when we're trying to get us ourselves into a state of more calories burned than calories stored, energy deficit scenario, and we know when we are in this state of negative energy flux, our NEAT tends to go down by varying degrees based on our genetics. Resistance training seems to attenuate, reduce, our specific reduction in need. So let's say my reduction in need isn't very much, someone else's is much bigger, but both of us seemingly will benefit from doing some resistance training during this dieting phase, let's call it, will benefit from our metabolism, and we're talking our total metabolism, not a BMR, but our total energy expenditure. The amount that that will reduce as a result of dieting will be less because we included some resistance training. You may need to just click that little button 15 seconds, 30 seconds back. Just listen to that again if you need to clarify that. So the negative effects, the reduction in our overall energy expenditure over 24 hours might be less, is likely to be less in research has been shown to be less and you can click the link in the show notes to find this study might be less as because we engaged in some resistance training activity during a diet. So I'm kind of trying to build a picture for people to be able to make their own decisions. Like you are going to retain muscle slash build muscle more during your diet if you're doing resistance training that is a hugely obvious fact you are going to be able to change the shape of your body more by engaging in the resistance training and then you can use diet to uh, lose body fat put yourself in a calorie deficit you also have all of these other opportunities to be active in life but maybe you're saying that you don't likewise you can have a brilliant resistance training program that is two three four five days per week and you can so let's say you do four days a week of brilliant resistance training you do an upper lower upper lower or push pull legs push you know rotation or whatever you want to do arms chest arms chest arms arms chest arms 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 chest legs arms, chest, arms, arms, chest, back, arms, chest, arms is my preferred training program. But on the other days, you might want to do arms, cardio, arms, chest, arms, cardio, arms, cardio, arms, chest, back, cardio, arms, legs, cardio. And I'm saying cardio, that's when I'm talking about walking. But anyway, I'll stop messing about now. You see what I mean is like this person has given us this scenario where I've got one hour today, one hour per day to move. And it's like, cool. It can be different on different days. 
and it depends on your out you know your goals in terms of you know as a uh, if someone was your coach it would be looking at like let's look at the overall we've got seven days we've got seven hours how are we going to prescribe these seven hours there's also the important thing of going well how much do you want to improve your fitness because walking isn't going to hugely improve pr- fitness unless your baseline fitness levels are very very low and actually you can improve vo2 max you can improve your cardiovascular system through certain types of resistance training as well so you know can you almost subconsciously or without increasing the tax on your time increase your need and increase steps done through different daily activities and then use that time to do resistance training likewise i will just finish by saying change your training up so you're doing 45 minutes resistance training and then 50 minutes of moving of walking of even you know potentially doing some higher intensity interval type training which will really really stress your heart benefit your cardiovascular system and almost you know just your volume of training will just go up in that time period when your time poor high intensity interval training is actually quite an effective time efficient way of of doing those things for fat loss we then just have you know then there becomes discussions about impact on appetite impact on yeah your state of energy flux what your appetite does in the in the long term so i feel like I've given you some interesting insights there. I've talked to you about some research. I've I've not given you some exact answers, but I hope I've probably at least gone, do some resistance training. I saw someone discussing about don't sacrifice sleep for, you know, some extra steps. And I thought, you know what, that's a brilliant recommendation because there are people out there going, you know what, I get six hours sleep. But if I just get five and a half or five, but I get an extra, you know, I need to hit my 10K steps. I need to get up before work. Actually, do you know what? Your appetite's going to go up. How inactive are you really? Do you need to be doing those? Why are you doing those? Sleep is so important for so many different things in terms of mood, mental health, appetite, recovery. You know, people talk about balancing hormones. Forget all these fancy protocols. Just flipping get enough sleep that's this kind of scenario that we're talking about here as well cool anyway until next time i think i might actually just quickly turn this podcast around and record one straight away on this you know my my mind's going on this whole personalized nutrition rubbish going on just just again Ah, i'll do it i hope you enjoyed this podcast please do if you're listening on spotify leave a review you don't even have to leave a review you just literally click a button five stars or or whatever stars but probably five stars five stars i mean five stars fine much love five stars